Around 57 AD, Paul wrote the book of Romans to answer the deepest questions about the gospel. 2,000 years later, it's doing exactly that. Well, good morning, Fellowship Middlebrook. Unless you were here over Christmas break, you may be saying, now, now who is that up there? Because it's been a while since I've had a privilege of being in this spot to teach, except for over Christmas. Um, the end of 2019, you see all the building and changing going on outside. My role at the end of 2019 was taking care of all the remodeling and building and structuring and changing inside as we move into a season where we're working at sharing more and more of our leadership with our next generation of leaders. And so it was a great time. I missed this role. I'll be here a lot more in 2020 than I was at the end of 2019. And so what a great moment to come back in that we are in this passage. Our teaching pastor, Greg Pinkner, has described this in Ephesians 2, 1 through 10 as, as like the, the Mount Everest, the apex, the kind of the, the height of the expression of the gospel. All the scriptures teach Jesus and the gospel. But here we get a moment where it's like, just almost like uh, you have to step back and absorb it. So what I want to say to you about this passage before we begin and we read it again and we dive in is we're throwing everything we got at this. Greg, our teaching pastor, spoke in RD, part of our teaching team is speaking. I'm speaking this morning. We are throwing everything we have because this passage represents the gospel from which we discover our meaning and define who we are. From which we derive our motivation on why we do everything we do. And from which we develop our means, our how it is that we live this gospel. This, this expression is the moment we step back and say, oh, that's what it's about. So I've decided to memorize it. I won't hold you accountable to that. I encourage you to do so. I'm gonna memorize it. I'm gonna copy it and put it in my journal because there's a lot of things happening in this church and a lot of movement God's building and going. We don't wanna forget this is where it comes from. You're welcome to do what my son Ben has done, and he's actually tattooed the reference on his chest, all right? That's not me recommending that you do that, all right? But if the spirit moves, be faithful, all right? So, whatever you wanna do with the passage, here we go, I'm gonna read it to you. And if you've got the background of Romans chapter three behind you of talking about how absolutely utter, I mean, Romans one through three, how absolutely, utterly lost we are and without hope, here comes the good news. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he has passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus, amen? If we understand how absolutely we're hopeless we are without that gift, it's almost like a spiritual gasp. Like, oh, oh my goodness. December the 24th, 1968, three men are orbiting the moon in Apollo 8. And on the third passage around, they see what they couldn't see the first two times. They circle the moon. And a picture was taken by Jim Lovell and the picture is called Earth Rising. You should listen to the podcast, BBC podcast, 13 Minutes to the Moon. You get to hear their conversation. They're bickering like an old couple. <laughs> They're arguing, give me this, get, no, get, you, I got it, I got it. I, and calm, one of them says, calm down. You're, like, you're a quarter of a million miles away from the Earth and human nature is the same as it is back here, right? 
But here's even more. They just knew this moment, like this. This captures a truth that can only be known if you're looking at it from a quarter of a million miles away. And this passage captures a truth that can only be seen if your heart's engaged up close to the reality of Jesus, but stepping back to what in the world in the universe is going on here. So I'm gonna go back to the passage. We're gonna focus on righteousness today. That's where we are in the passage. I'm gonna show you the passage with some color coding. It's gonna look really ugly and confusing, but hang with me, there's a point in it, all right? So here are some words that I've highlighted because we've been talking about them. I've highlighted in orange what we've been hearing the last few weeks. Faith, believe, grace is a gift, faith. That it's all, as RD and Greg have shown us, it's all a gift. I've also highlighted the word justified and just and justifier for this magnificent truth that everything in Romans up to this point is telling us that God is totally, 100% justified in his judgment and condemnation of sin. He's 100%, there is no lack of justice. Imagine being one of the five, six billion, seven billion, how many billion people there are on this earth on that little speck in the universe and saying to the creator, uh, no, actually I'm going to define justice. But the just one, the, the God of justice is the justifier. He's the one by whom we are justified in the propitiation, this, this sacrifice. Here's the deal. You can't do, you're condemned in your sin. I got this by his blood, the blood of Jesus Christ. And so this righteousness, and, and Greg a couple weeks ago talked about righteousness as being rightly related. Let me expand it just a little bit more. That it's, the idea of righteousness is right one. So in God, everything is right. Got it? Like his morality, it's right. His integrity, it, it, it's right. His relationship is God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit's relationship to the universe, relationship to creation. It's right. It's always right. What he does is righteousness. And so true righteousness would be a rightness where we're rightly related as people to God, to who he is, to ourselves, and to others, which is obviously the first two commandments. This is the right relationship with God. And now, now, we, we hear this truth, and we're going to go back and talk more about righteousness, but let me explode your mind a little bit. Why? Why? Well, look at the um, words that I highlight in green. Has been manifested. This was to show. It was to show. So if you read Ephesians 1, you're going to drill down a little further and say he planned this before the foundation of the world. And why did he do that? To the praise of his glorious grace. This righteousness is on display to his honor and to his glory. Amen? Not to you. Not to me. In fact, Ephesians 3 tells us that the church is created to put him on display to even what you cannot see in the invisible spiritual world. This is God's righteousness on display. And it is about his gift. It is not about us doing righteous things. Do not be confused. The world will never gasp at, oh, look at those good Christians. Look at those good moral people. You know why? Because you can be good and moral without Jesus and his righteousness in human definitions. The thing that would make the world gasp is to look at this just God and look at me and say, there's no way but God, by his grace and for his glory. That's the story God is telling. That's the story of the spiritual universe. It's all a gift. Jesus tries to explain this to the scribes and Pharisees. They're not particularly interested because their whole life is about getting it right and putting themselves on display. This is just what you do. They get the law right, they do the law right, and they show you and this is supposed to be what God intends. And Jesus is telling him a, a parable, Matthew 22. And he's saying, hey, there's this banquet. And we invited all the people you'd think we'd want to invite to the banquet. 
the uppity ups, the muckety mucks, the rich, the influential, the image, the people that make you feel better about you. Oh, they got invited to the banquet. This must be a big banquet. I'm glad I'm invited. All those people, we invited them and they didn't think it was worth it. So what we did was we went out and we just picked up every person we could who said, I'd love to be at a banquet like that, but I don't deserve it. I don't have the clothes for it. I don't have the, because here's the deal. You don't need them. Because what we may miss in this culture is that when you were invited to the banquet, particularly a banquet like this, a royal banquet, a banquet of honor, it was the host and hostess responsibility to supply you with your robe, with your garment. It wasn't about the garment you wore in, it was about the garment you were given when you arrived. And Jesus tells this story and he's saying, they didn't come and they didn't, and, he, and the Pharisees and scribes, and they know he's talking about them. So they're already, appropriate language, angry. And then he says something, which Jesus often does. It's like, oh, you think that offended you? Listen to this. Like, you think that bothers your flesh? You think that offends your religiosity? I got something for you. You don't even want to hear. Here it is, Matthew 22, verse 11. When the king came in to look at the guests, he saw there a man who had no wedding garment. And he said to them, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And the man was speechless because he'd been found out. And the king said to the attendants, bind him hand and foot and cast him into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth for many are called, but few are chosen. Oh, yikes. What's Jesus saying? There's no way in but my righteousness. The robe is free. It's a gift. But if you think in any way you're gonna sneak, earn, manipulate, find a way, know somebody, be connected, raised in the home of the person who's there, and that's how you get in here, you misunderstand your need for my righteousness. I love how W.A. Criswell, if you don't know W.A. Criswell, he's a preacher from a long time ago, right? And sometimes they're the best. He says this, God, the king in this, in this story, and God provides the feast, the dinner, the place, the garments, all things are provided by the king because the whole banquet is to his glory. And so scripture often uses the thought or the picture of a robe of righteousness. It's a consistent image of being given this garment by the king. We don't deserve, we don't earn. As a matter of fact, we're kind of dragging in the stuff of the street and the byways and the stuff we've done and we bring all this junk in here and the king says, I got a robe for you. Don't miss the story of the prodigal son. We're not telling that story this morning. Don't miss that story though. A ring and a robe and sandals to proclaim you my child. There are four things this gift of righteousness will rescue you from. And, they're your own, and it's your only hope in all four. The first one is shame. If you have your Bibles, turn to Zechariah chapter three. Zechariah chapter three. What is shame? Shame is that thing you wake up in the middle of the night and you think, oh my God, if anybody but you knew this. Shame is that regret that's like an ulcer in your soul. Shame is that being in the room and thinking I don't belong because I'm not as good as. Shame is I'm less than because anybody who did that is less than. Now I could say, how many of you have experienced that? It would be a ridiculous exercise because you all have recently if you're walking in the spirit. Because when the flesh is exposed, we tend to like to be God of it and condemn ourselves, even though the scripture says there's no condemnation in Christ Jesus. As a matter of fact, there's something that lifts that condemnation. Zechariah chapter three. Then he showed, this is a vision. It's like a metaphor of the people of God. Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan, standing at his right hand to accuse him. And the Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, O Satan. The Lord has chosen 
Jerusalem, rebuke you. Do you hear the language? The Lord who has chosen, this is his choice. Is this not a brand plucked from the fire? Now Joshua is standing before the angel clothed in the filthy garments of the people of God's shame and regret and, and condemnation. He's just covered in it. And the Lord said to Satan, no, I'm giving definition to this. Before you go further, just think of it this way. So <clears throat> I moved a year and a half ago and post Christmas, December, January, that's the time when I'm doing my shopping because that's when I'm, any clothes I buy, if you ever see me, hey, that's a new shirt. He got it on sale, like 80% off. I don't, if it's not 80% off, I ain't buying it. So this, actually the shirt I'm wearing right here, I ordered and I forgot evidently to tell Banana Republic that my 80% off shirt needed to come to my new address and it must've been connected with my old address somehow. So I realized after it's too late and I can't get it back, I've sent it to these sweet people's home that I used to live in a year and a half ago. So I said to my wife, uh, we're gonna have to text them and tell them I got a shirt I gotta pick up. She said, how about you text them that, all right? I've been doing it the last year for you. Let's, why don't you do it now? <laughs> That's a different story. So I did and I said, I'm gonna come by. And so I walk in and I walk and I park there and like I could almost with my eyes closed drive into that neighborhood off of Campbell Station Road. I know how long it takes to drive, 20 years of driving. I know the neighbors everywhere I'm going there. I know this, I know the house. The, one of the neighbors cut a tree down. I saw it immediately. I know everything about this neighborhood. So I want you to imagine that I get in here in the neighborhood and I come to the house and I'm thinking, I just miss this place. They're not home. I think I'll just make myself at home. So I find a window that's on, and I climb in and I, and I go grab me something, something to eat and, and I turn the TV on and I put my feet up on the table, take my shoes off and I'm kicking back and I'm like, I'm gonna spend the afternoon because I just love this house. And they come home. Like, what are you doing here? I just had to get my shirt. Yeah, I know, but why are you in my house? Well, I lived here 20 years. You've been here a year and a half. I have the right to this place. I have lived here longer than you. That paint that out there, I, I painted that. That floor you walked on, I, I paid for that flooring. That grass is terrible. Well, that's my fault too. But all of this was, and I, I have the right to this. And they would say, no, I've got a legal document that says you don't have the right to this. I'm going to call the authorities on you. And so should they. So understand this in your filth and your shame when it gets exposed. When Satan comes to accuse you, you say to him, uh, the authorities say, you have no right here. I was there for, I've, I was in that addiction for 20 years. I get to tell you how that addiction names you. No, you don't. He gets to name it. I was there when you, yeah, I know, but God. And the angel said to those who were standing before him, remove the filthy rags from him. And to him he said, behold, I have taken your iniquity away from you and I will clothe you with pure vestments. And I said, Lord, let them be, put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him with garments. And the angel of the Lord was standing by. You might want to read more of this because this is really good stuff. He puts the clean righteousness on him and the shame is gone. And only his righteousness can rescue you from shame and only his righteousness can rescue you from legalism what I call get right-itis. Paul tries to describe in Philippians, look, I got it right. I'm the, legal, I'm, the, I'm the king of legalism. I'm the best at legalism. Nobody's better at legalism than me. Look at Philippians chapter three. If you want to turn there, it's chapter three, verses seven through 11. But whatever gain I had, I counted as lost for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I counted everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Are you ready? Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, which is a gift by grace. 
Jim Lovell, when, he, when they came around and took the picture of Earth rising, he tells an interesting story. He said, I held my thumb up and just with my thumb, I could obscure the earth. He said, it was crazy. At that time, there were 5 billion people. And he said, I'm obscuring 5 billion people and everything I know just with my thumb. Can you imagine like staying there? Like that was a curious thing. But could you imagine like, yeah, I'm just gonna look at my thumb. I need to cut my nails. Look, I got a cuticle there that needs to be trimmed. Earth rising is behind your thumb. Yeah, but I'm just kind of checking out my thumb right now. All of evangelicals history in America, the good news is when it's held the gospel. The bad news is when it's self-righteousness obscures his glory. Whether it be in the church, in the community, in the government, in the marketplace. Nothing obscures the glory of his righteousness like you and I trying to be good enough. The religious life says, I am righteous because I do things that are just and good and generous. Isaiah says, like Romans 1, 2, and part of 3, we've all become like one who is unclean and all our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. We all fade like a leaf and our iniquities like the wind take us away. Good things attempted to prove your good are as filthy as the things that you don't want people to know about. There's a place for goodness and justice and generosity. Here's the biblical truth and vision. I can learn to live as his, as his justice. I can learn to live as his goodness. I can learn to live as his generosity because he has gifted his righteousness righteousness to me by grace through faith. You live in Appalachia. Some of you are not from Appalachia. I'm from Appalachia. Let me tell you the Appalachian way. Shame. Try hard enough. Be good enough. Righteousness of God rescues us from that and says, no, no, no. And we're like, well, yeah, but like if, if I didn't feel ashamed, maybe I wouldn't want to do good. This is the opposite the more I understand of my need for his righteousness, the more I want to live his goodness. And it's just the more I want to put him on display. It's what I want to do. It's just, I, look, earth rising. Look, everybody see this? This is amazing. This is my God. Shame, legalism also rescues us from license. The word license is the concept of being my way. I, no barriers, unbridled, un, un uh, Boundaried. I can do kind of whatever I will, please. This passage I'm about to read you is in Ephesians 4, and it immediately follows Paul talking about sexual licentiousness, which comes from the word license. And what Paul is saying is, you're, you're taking this incredible seed of power and pleasure, sexuality, and you're turning it into something that's about your sovereign self, and you're making it about your expression. You're not submitting your expression Christians often get rightly accused of repressing sexuality. We're not called to repress it. We're called to submit it healthily and find its healthy expression. And that is true whether you're homosexual, heterosexual, pansexual, asexual, fill in the blank sexual. It's true for all of us. And Paul says to those in whatever sexuality you may be expressing, whatever way you're finding license, Paul says to them in Ephesians 4.20, but that's not the way you learn Christ. That's not what you learn. Assuming you've heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus to put off your old self. That's not to put off all your sexual desire. That's not to put off everything that you're struggling to work with. It's to put off being God of it because that, whether you're, if you're sexually pure to show that you've earned his righteousness, that's sin too. This is about showing this new self, this clothes of righteousness, put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires and be renewed in the spirit of your minds and put on the new self created after the likeness of God. Are you ready? Created after the likeness of God. Are you ready? Created after the likeness of God in true 
righteousness and holiness. Put on the robe of his righteousness. Take off these garments of legalism and license and shame. And then finally, this is going to sound like a bigger word, but it helps me a little bit. It means limited vision, but I use it this way. Spiritual myopia, spiritual myopia. Myopia is a technical term for nearsightedness. I am so nearsighted when I go to the eye doctor, if I take my glasses off, I don't have my contacts in. I literally cannot see the E on the eye chart. I am so nearsighted, I cannot, I have no idea what that word is. I'm so nearsighted that my friend Doug Wright sits about six rows back and I just know that because I have my glasses on. I see a shirt there that's the color. I think I'm pointing at Doug. I have no idea. If I'm not, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm so nearsighted that Denny, I know Denny's sitting right there and I can kind of see the outline of you, Denny, but I have no idea that there, I've known Denny. How long have I known her? I don't, 15 years? I don't know, 20 years? I can't see her. Whoa, there you are, right? Spiritual myopia. It's as if you're in the lunar module. It's the first moment you've seen earth rising and you pull out your cell phone to play your favorite game. That's what happens when you think this story is about you. Oh, I won. Now I can spend $4.99 to get the next level. This is great. Hey, look out the window. I, not now. Oh, yeah, that's cool. Spiritual myopia. Isaiah 61 tells a story of God's righteousness. It's going to, if you listen to it, kind of blow you away because it's not just about what he's doing to you. There's something else going on here. Isaiah 61. It's worth turning to because we're going to do several passages from there. I'm going to go a little quickly, but we're going to dive into it. Jesus reads these words to say, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing right after he's tempted in the wilderness as he launches his ministry. Here's what he says. Isaiah 61, one, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the, own, the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn, to grant to those who mourn in Zion, to give them a grant and to grant to those who mourn in Zion, to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit. I'm going to stop right there. Jesus just described his calling from the father to express the father's righteousness in social justice, in compassion for the poor, in the reaching out to those who are lost, in the coming alongside those who have been marginalized, in the raising up and the empowering of those who are somehow being left out and pushed to the side and ignored or oppressed. And Jesus says it beautifully, it's powerfully, the Lord called me to do this. And he did it with everyone that he was called to. So in John 17, he said, I've done all the work you've called me to do. You do notice there are a lot of people he walked by because he wasn't called to do that. Jesus wasn't trying to prove his love for the Father. He was demonstrating the love of the Father. He was offering his righteousness to the world so he could see it. So when we think about righteousness and its impact, it's not legalism, but it does have impact. But listen to the long game. Here's the long arc of righteousness. A garment of praise instead of a faint spirit, that they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. Jesus is always looking in the full vision, not just to what he's doing, but where's this thing going and what is, where it's going and where the kingdom is going is about planting seeds of righteousness that will grow up to be oaks of his righteousness in the world. He reiterates it in 61 verse 10. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exult in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with a robe of righteousness. Goodness gracious, people. Don't get stuck here. Look at this story. He's covered me with a robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decks himself out like a priest with a beautiful headdress and as a bride adorns herself with jewels for as the earth brings forth its sprouts and as a garden causes what is sown to be sprout, in it to sprout up, so the Lord God will call righteousness and praise to sprout up before all the nations. He's talking about you 
and me and this radical kingdom of his righteousness and our participation in it generation after generation after generation. He's talking about planting seeds that begin to sprout as tender little things like this two day old oak tree that believe it or not, eventually will come to this place. He's talking about his righteousness. God's righteousness is his gift of himself to you for his glory and for your joy. He's talking about bringing you into the big story that can only be seen from the perspective of the whole gospel. He's saying this, that his work in you to take you from that little sprout into this picture of who he is and to have you then be a part of the planting of those seeds from generation to generation, he's saying that is more glorious to his name than that. You want to see me? This is amazing. It's like, this is amazing. It's, it's awe-inspiring. He says, you want to see me? Look at what I do with sinful, unrighteous people. And here's what he says of us and those in whom we plant the seeds. They shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall raise up the form, former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastation of many generations. It's just who they will be.